what I would say when it comes to space exploration is I think people should be thinking more about the fact that our situation on Earth is actually pretty precarious. Um, we're not nearly as safe as we like to think we are. Um, and the reason we like to think that we're safe is because thinking about being in danger all the time is stressful. Nobody wants to think about that. But we have dangers coming down the line from artificial intelligence. We have dangers from biotechnology. We have dangers from, from nuclear weapons. We have dangers from, from bad politicians making bad decisions. Um, and you know, there are just so many, so many things in the world that are, that are bad choices and bad, bad possibilities for the future. Welcome everyone from the Outpost. Today, our esteemed guest is a professor, uh, Brian Patrick Green. He's the director of technology uh, of ethics at Markula Center for Applied Ethics and the author of Space Ethics, a book that examines every ethical question of space exploration. His work focuses on the ethics of technology, such as AI, ethics of technological manipulation of humans, risky technologies that might be catastrophic, and its impact on human life, society, and religion. Dr. Green, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so we'll get into the ethical arguments in a moment, but I do have a very important question to ask you. We're sitting now in 2023. Um, a few years, the past few years, were, were difficult on almost everyone. Um, Maybe there is one silver lining in all of this is that people may be being locked between being locked down in their homes, maybe having extra time, um, had their eyes opened somehow to, to issues that probably they wouldn't have discussed prior to all of these events happening. Things that were kind of in the background became part of the mainstream discourse. Um, so people kind of woke up to how things happen or to the, I would say the, maybe the dysfunction of certain institutions, the authoritarian tendencies for some of, from the governments, um, people turning against each other based on things that they've read or heard or what they thought is the truth so now that we're emerging from all of this, you being an ethical professor looking at everything from the outside uh, for with your experience, how do, how do you evaluate the past few years from an ethical standpoint? Where are we as yeah, the society? Past few years, the past few years have definitely been difficult, as you said, and they've really been difficult worldwide. And uh, they really highlighted that we, uh, as, a, as, a, as a species, as humanity here on Earth, we need to be thinking in a more global perspective. Because originally, for example, the pandemic started as just one person in China, and that spread, of course, to affect the entire world. So we, we really need to have a more comprehensive, I think, view of, of uh, what we're doing here on Earth and how we are all in this together. There's no way for us to be separated from each other anymore. Uh, we really are connected and we really do need to care about everyone everywhere because ultimately, uh, you know, one person's well-being can affect all of us. And um, yeah, then the, the, the issue is, I think, for the past few years that we've always heard about the common good and the good for everyone. Throughout history, the common good might have resulted in less favorable conditions to, to, to certain individuals who did not necessarily want to participate. What do you say about this? How, do, how can we reconcile what happened with continuing to, to trust everyone in order to make sure that everyone still maintains this common good together? Yeah, the, the common good, certainly, it, it's a notion that can be abused. And certainly, we've seen that happen in the past, where people have taken this idea to say that, uh, you know, the common good means that you belong where you are in society, and you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't try for other things, or you should be glad for whatever circumstances you have. 
as opposed to striving for better things. Um, there are all sorts of ways. Every ethical system, I'll say, can be can be abused, and it is it has been abused in the past. Um, what I think might be helpful to remember or to think about from the perspective of the last few years is that, uh, yes, the, the common good is certainly something that can be abused, but it's also it's still a very valid ethical notion, which is that, like I was saying, everybody in the world, we're in this together. We need to think about each other's health. We need to think about each other's well-being. And then the question is, what's the right way to do that? What are the, the measures or steps that we should take? And what are the expectations that we need to have of each other, too? So, for example, we should always expect that the government is looking out for its own citizens. But uh, understandings of what that means exactly, what that could mean, uh, could vary dramatically from place to place. And so we need to be sensitive to that level of, uh, of uh, difference that we should allow. And at the same time, you know, respecting differences between different groups of people and different individuals and how they would like to live their lives. Um, we have to, it, you know, it's a constant negotiation, I would say, between kind of the individual and the group and how they relate to each other in order to make sure that uh, everybody can achieve everything that they would like to. So I, I would like to go into the first to start with, based on what you just said, start from the basics of what is ethics and the different types of ethical um, tools that you've alluded to in the book, like the deontology, consequentialism, and utilitarianism. And if you can please briefly explain what is ethics and the difference between those different concepts. Sure. So ethics has a lot of different definitions and many different people will define it differently. But at the kind of the fundamental, most basic level, the ethics is trying to do good and avoid evil. That's uh, that's often called the first principle of practical reason. The first principle of speculative reason or theoretical reasoning is that a thing cannot both be and not be in the same way, at the same place at the same time. So you can't have that's called the principle of non-contradiction. You can't have something that is both is and is not in the same time at the same way. So just like theoretical reasoning has that basic principle of non-contradiction as its foundation. Uh, more practical reasoning, which is what ethics is. Ethics is about studying how to do things practically in the real world. Uh, the first principle of practical reason is that you should do good and avoid evil. And then the question becomes, well, what is good and evil? And that is where you start getting into questions like you were saying of uh, deontology, which is the study of duty, or it's kind of a rule-based uh, understanding of approach to ethics. Um, then there's consequentialism and utilitarianism, which are more focused on what's the outcome, what are the what are the uh, the effects of the actions that we make, and then there's also virtue ethics. Virtue ethics thinks about who we are as a human being and who we should be and should become, and then there are, there are even other approaches to ethics also. So, for example, there's case-based analysis, which takes one case and compares it to another case, and says between these two cases, what is similar, what's different, and uh, based on what we've decided previously, how should we decide on this uh, future case that we're looking at? I see. So I have a question with regards to that. For example, if we're thinking about lying as a mm -hmm. concept. So lying to me, at least before um, I, I read the book, to me, or at least before anything happened in the past few years, was a no no mm -hmm. to lying at all scales it's unethical mm -hmm. is there a noble lie is there a case where we can justify a lie like because we're talking about the consequentialism and the and what the outcome is and everything around that question so what do you say about that yeah, this is this is a classic ethical problem, and it goes. There are many many examples throughout history of where people have had this exact same question. Is they they say to themselves, well, the rule is that you never lie, no matter what. But then you get in a situation where, for example, um, if you tell the truth, then somebody could die because of it. And a classic example of this would be uh, in Nazi Germany. Certain people were, of course, hiding, you know, Jewish people or others who were being persecuted in their houses. 
And when the Nazi police officers or SS or whoever comes and knocks on your door and says, are you hiding any Jews or do you know where any Jews are? Uh, then they would have to, if they were going to tell the truth, they would have to say, yes, I'm actually hiding Jews in my house. And then, of course, all of them get hauled off to the concentration camp and killed. Um, so in that case, you have to ask yourself, well, maybe lying seems like it would be the lesser evil in this case. And so each one of those ethical perspectives that I just described to you could potentially come up with a different response there. So a deontological approach would say, for example, that rule is simple, you never lie. Um, but at the same time, there's another rule, which is that you're not supposed to harm people. You're not supposed to uh, let people come to harm. Maybe that would be the rule. Or you could phrase it in various other ways. Um, don't let other people you know, kill people that you care about, for example, or anyone for that matter. Um, in which case, in the deontological system, if you have two rules, the rules can contradict with each other and hit. And then you say, okay, I don't know what the right answer is there because I have two rules that are not playing well together. Um, so maybe then you look at it from the consequentialist perspective and you say, well, if I let this happen, if I tell the truth in this case, we all get killed. And that's a very big, bad thing. And uh, not only that, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it, uh, it's gonna, it's actually harmful to the people who are, who are asking to be the murderers, right? In this case, the helping helping people do evil in which case the nazis are trying to do evil in this case for example helping them to do their job actually makes them worse people um that would be a more virtue ethics perspective because you're kind of facilitating them doing evil by telling them the truth um in which case maybe you don't want to turn them into worse people so you say no i'm not going to tell you the truth in this case uh, so that would be the more virtue ethics perspective the consequentialist perspective is you're weighing the value of truth against the value of human lives and uh then, of course, the, if you want to look at it from a more case-based perspective, you say, well, what, if, what cases can we look at in the past to evaluate how different people have had to deal with this? And there have certainly been, you know, other cases in the past where people have had to make the choice between telling the truth and uh, perhaps uh, valuing human life. And what have they chosen and why? Is that, uh, is that something that we can learn from or not? So a lot of things to unpack here. Um, it sounds like in anything that we do, we do have to think about all of these different tools in order to arrive at a good decision-making process. Do you think that, do you think that these tools have been used as they should have been? with regards not only to what happened in the past few years to now what we're seeing in technology and advancement and progress and do you think that people who are in charge of developing all of what we have now do you think that they think about these questions for the most part no <laughs> the answer is people are not primarily thinking about ethics when they're thinking about developing technologies at least there there may be let me back up a step. Some people are developing technologies for the sake of helping people. So for example, anybody who's doing medical technology or pharmaceutical research or those sorts of things are predominantly thinking about how can I help people to live healthier, longer lives and experience more well-being. Uh, that's kind of the fundamental motivation behind the people in that industry. Um, at the same time, the people who run those corporations are thinking about money so they're thinking about harnessing the goodwill of all their employees in order to create a product that they can sell that keeps the company afloat. And of course, it does other good things like paying their employees. That's good. Um, and of course, overall, hopefully providing benefit to, to general, generally, you know, people on the face of the earth. But uh, let's let's change it to a slightly different topic, change it to just uh, technology, you know, software development, for example, I live in near Silicon Valley, my uh, university, Santa Clara University is in Silicon Valley. And so when people are developing, for example, a new video game, or they're thinking about artificial intelligence, um, they're not necessarily always thinking about um, how best to help people. They might be thinking about, yes, we want to entertain people, or yes, we want to provide people with a product that they like. But ultimately, that might be a product that just wastes their time really effectively, because everybody's thinking about if you have an advertising based business model, then you just want to keep eyeballs on your app. So social media, for example, thinks about that all the time. 
And so they're not thinking about these kind of ethical tools. And even in the previous case of, a, of say, the, the uh, medical research industry, um, they're probably not thinking about these exact tools either. But one of the reasons for that is because medical research is already highly regulated. There are lots and lots of rules on top of it, and most of those rules embed some sort of ethical position behind them. Uh, software engineering, on the other hand, is not so highly regulated. In fact, it's very unregulated. And so actually one of the things we do when we talk to companies, because the Markowitz Center, one of the things we do is we help companies think through these issues. Um, and they say, you know what, there's no laws that are, there's no laws that apply to what we're doing. And uh, one of the best responses to that was, I, somebody said that once they were at a startup, they were creating, uh, they wanted to create glowing plants. That was their goal. And they said, there are no rules. We, there's no rules about what we're doing. And a lawyer turned to the person and said, yes, there are rules. What you need to be saying is that you're complying with every relevant regulation. Because of course there are rules. You can't just you know dump pollution places and, and uh, all sorts of things like that. So they were just kind of following the rules as they, uh, as they already had kind of internalized them. Because we, a lot of the rules we follow just because we don't even think about them, we internalize them. You stop at a stop sign and uh, you know those sorts of things um going more towards space that's where you know things get really interesting because there are a very limited number of rules when it comes to space when it comes to consequences we can't always predict what those consequences will be because space is such a very different different location and uh when it comes to being a good person it's uh, an interesting question as to what kind of good people we should be when we're thinking about space. It's probably fairly similar to what a good person looks like on Earth. That's more virtue ethics perspective. Um, that's one of the nice things about virtue ethics is that it is very flexible. And lastly, as far as case-based analysis go, there's a lot of examples of people using these comparative cases. Uh, so for example, the Outer Space Treaty has some strong similarities to the Antarctic Treaty, and it has similarities to the law of the sea, for example. So as we go forth, into space, we have these previous sorts of legal treaties and other approaches that people have looked at where we make comparison, how is space similar, how is space different, and you know, at some point if people land on or settle ultimately on the moon or on Mars, we're going to have to think about what are the laws going to be like on the moon or Mars, and of course people are going to look to the laws that we already have and figure out how those apply or do not apply to the new situation that uh, people find themselves in. So the, I, I know that the book is called Space Ethics. I, I know that um, this is basically the start of our conversation, but I do know that you have way more, you've done way more in terms of technology and ethics and technology, and your research is not just this, this related to space. But if we want to start from space as the basic discussion point that will um, will kind of whenever or I have to say when I read the book I could see clearly that even though it's about space all of the questions are kind of things that we have to ask about anything that we do so it's not just I can remove space as a concept and I can insert something else and it would kind of magically gives me the same set of questions that I have to deal with and that's what was so great um, so if we go to the book and then the argument was and quote space is everything that is around and beyond the earth it is the final frontier of human exploration the universe is vast spanning billions of light years yet every human have ever born has lived on the speck and all human ethical systems have been developed here with this planet and human beings in mind our perspective has been limited However, humankind is leaving the Earth, slowly heading for the stars. Each of these various endeavors in space raise many questions such as, is it technically possible? Is it politically possible? Is it economically worth it? And ultimately, the question of ethics, is it good? And if so, then should we? Close quote. So this is the, the idea, is the should mm -hmm. of it and why. In, from, from reading your book, it looks clear that there is more, there is no, yes, 
ex space exploration. It's not a black and white mm -hmm. uh, space exploration is good or bad, but it looks like there's more good kind of going through yes to space exploration and technology. It might give us more things than um, not doing it. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the this question about space exploration and technologies and and how are we going to um now that we're moving forward the the the, the outer space treaty hasn't been updated mm -hmm. recently at all so all of these questions are based on i think it's 1967 yeah if i'm not mistaken that was right. when it's last done now not only we have to answer this question but we have to see how to even apply those rules in order to answer this question for whoever entity or government is trying to get to space? Yeah, there are there are so many questions when it comes to space, and you're exactly right. The Outer Space Treaty is old. Uh, you know, 1967 is a long time ago, and it has not been updated. And it's there have been people talking about updating it for decades, but it hasn't been done. Um, and so we're we're stuck in this kind of interesting space if you want to call it that <laughs> where we have to figure out um what exactly are we going to do what is what is the good that we are aiming for and uh as you just uh mentioned in that quote uh you know the human human perspective really has been limited to here on earth of course there are lots of ethical problems that we have here on earth and space takes all of those ethical problems and it just makes them bigger and so, for example, uh, there's the problem of space debris. Space debris is there is so much junk now that's whirling around the planet Earth, uh, you know, entire satellites down to just tiny little flecks of paint and a tiny fleck of paint is more than enough to to seriously damage something in in space because it's moving at, you know, kilometers per second velocity. Um, we have to look towards look at this and say, this is a problem that is literally bigger than the planet Earth. The, the planet Earth is you know, this big and the whirling cloud of debris around the planet is bigger than the planet Earth. And we made that problem. Um, so you know, littering on Earth is a problem, but when you're littering in space, it's an even bigger problem. And so we have to think about now even more, um, now that we have this enormous amount of power, how are we going to take that power and actually direct it towards something good? And all through human history, we've been having this, this uh, you know, constant struggle. What is the right thing to do? What is good? How should we act in this case? What does a good human being look like? Uh, what should be our goals in life? And uh, now that we're really even going beyond the planet, we have to ask those same questions again. And I think that one of the most interesting things about space ethics is that I think that we will, as we go out into space, we'll look back at Earth and say to ourselves, um, wow, Earth is an even more amazing place than we ever thought it was. And hopefully it'll it'll help us uh, raise our own conscience and conscientiousness and think about uh, taking better care of our own planet because honestly, this is a great place. We can breathe the air. The temperature is roughly, you know, correct, you know, depending on where we live. Antarctica, not so much. Uh, California is pretty nice. Um, but uh, you have to really appreciate the fact that the moon is has no air it's a vacuum and the temperature fluctuates between you know very very low and very very high and uh, all of space is like that you know to a greater or lesser extent um, and i think that one of the things that hopefully ethics will help us uh, do is come to appreciate uh, what we have here on earth so for with regards to the space exploration for example do you think that so far it's we have been abiding by the outer space treaty because governments and nations and now private corporations are respecting this uh treaty or it just happens that so far they didn't have to contend with doing anything against the treaty i'm just wondering uh, if it's if it's actually working, if such a regulation is actually working or it's just a document, what are the consequences of people not complying with something like the space degree debris? Sorry. Right. So the first thing I would say is that as far as we know, the Outer Space Treaty is being followed. Um, so one of the things that 
the Outer Space Treaty bans is it bans weapons of mass destruction in outer space. We don't actually know if a country has a satellite up there that's actually a nuclear weapon. It's just sitting up there waiting to be sent the signal to explode. We don't know if that is the case or not. We don't think it is the case, and it would be very risky for any country to do something like that because, um, you know, that's a very threatening sort of thing to do, which is why it's banned by the Outer Space Treaty in the first place. So as far as we know, the Outer Space Treaty is being followed. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the Outer Space Treaty is pretty basic in a lot of its things. So, for example, it says that if somebody needs rescuing in space, somebody should rescue them. Or if a piece of uh, space debris crashes into something, then there's a certain amount of liability for that, although there's a follow-on treaty that, that describes exactly how that liability works. Um, so, a lot of the times when we're talking about following the Outer Space Treaty, it's not that difficult because it's very basic kind of stuff that applies just as it would on Earth. Um, the weapons of mass destruction piece would be kind of an exception. Um, but the other thing I would say is that um, treaties do get violated, treaties do get broken, and if a country wants to withdraw from the Outer Space Treaty, people, you know, a country could do that, and they could say, we're not following the treaty anymore. And that would be an extremely threatening sign to other countries on Earth who would then see that as a p potential escalation. Why are you doing that? What are your intentions by withdrawing from the Outer Space Treaty? So there are certainly benefits that we're that we're receiving from having the treaty structured as the way it is, and as far as we know, everyone's following it. But uh, the situation isn't necessarily going to continue on, especially as we have more and more uh, things happening in space. So and commercial activities, for example, in space. At some point, uh, you know, some company, say, you know, SpaceX, for example, is going to say, hey, we want to have a nuclear reactor on Mars. Um, and of course, if it's a nuclear reactor, it's going to be creating nuclear waste. And if it's structured in a particular way, they could uh, use it to develop nuclear weapons. And Elon Musk has said this in the past. You know, one of the nice ways to warm up Mars would be to set off hydrogen bombs on the glacial ice caps in the north and south. And so you think to yourself, I don't think it's a good idea for a corporation to have access to hydrogen bombs. Um, and also, that's a violation of the Outer Space Treaty because there aren't supposed to be, uh, you know, nuclear weapons in outer space. And then it becomes a responsibility of the United States to enforce that because SpaceX is a country is a company that is uh, based in the United States. Um, the United States is a signatory to the Outer Space Treaty. Therefore, we are in charge of enforcing that treaty on anybody who launches from the United States. Um, but let's say at the same time, let's say that a company in China or Russia was doing the same thing and those governments were not interested in enforcing that rule. There is no enforcement mechanism in the Outer Space Treaty that lets another country say, hey, you're, you're, allow you're allowing a, or you are violating the Outer Space Treaty by allowing this company that you work with to violate the Outer Space Treaty, do something about it. And if the other, company, the other country sorry, says no, then uh, there's no enforcement mechanism. And this becomes a major problem with any sort of treaty, right? Any sort of international treaty relies on the goodwill of the countries that are signatories to it. And some of them have enforcement mechanisms and some of them do not. Uh, but uh, typically the enforcement mechanisms are, um, there's either nothing or people start saying, you know, stop doing that. Think of the, the recent chemical weapons problem that was in, in uh, Syria a few years ago. Um, basically, other countries said stop doing that, and then they stopped doing it. So, once again, there's not really great enforcement mechanisms, and we all have to figure out how we are going to cooperate in order to live together in peace. Otherwise, we're not going to have peace. Yeah, and another example to follow up on what you just said is the, uh, for example, the climate in the Paris mm -hmm. Agreement. No matter how much of the Western civilization is going to cut down on emissions countries like in like china is contributing even more and if that faucet is not closed i don't know how we can be able to um to move with the um a greener planet because for example in china they are prioritizing growth um, and they don't necessarily think that they would have to contribute. So even if these treaties exist, which they do, like you said, there's there are going to be some motives that 
will not necessarily um, be, they will allow for, uh, for countries to continue to do what they're doing um, regardless. Right. And another thing, you bring a good point about peace. Because so far, I think that um, peace, probably a very big reason why peace is achieved, uh, even though there is nuclear weapons, is the idea that we do have nuclear weapons like mm -hmm. Russia does and United States does. So the idea that both have it maybe created this kind of peace, notwithstanding the latest events. but. The idea that the risk of war or nuclear war kind of puts everyone on a on the um, more like the peaceful side so far, and not only that, I think that also growth also allows for conflicts to be avoided in the sense that if the, like you said, I think you also said it in the book where there if there is a good outlet for people to pursue and progress and growth and uh, accumulating um, wealth and developing their own countries, this would, and if they're allowed to do that, if everyone is allowed to do that, then it will also avoid further conflict. And maybe the conflict will happen once one party feels that they are not allowed to have this the same way as everyone else. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I might be an optimist in that way, which is that hopefully if, if there is this productive outlet for us to direct our energies towards, then maybe we'll have uh, less likely to, to, uh, to move towards unproductive outlets, for example, violence or, or destruction of the environment or things like that. Um, you know, certainly, certainly people have noted that uh, there has not been a major world war since the development of nuclear weapons. Um, however, we constantly get into these near situations where Russia has been threatening for the last year that they're going to use nuclear weapons, you know, stop, stop helping Ukraine or we're going to use nuclear weapons. And it's all over their news. And it's, that's certainly something that they seem to be preparing their, even their own population for thinking about. Um, and if we go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis in, in uh, the early 1960s, um, certainly we had that pro this same sort of problem back then also where tensions were very high and uh, people seem to want to actually do these terrible things. So we're in this kind of constant situation where we have to, to make these ethical choices constantly. And one of the interesting or kind of important distinctions to make is that ethics and politics, of course, do relate to each other. Um, when, you know, for example, one of my favorite, favorite philosophers is Aristotle. Aristotle wrote a book called Ethics and he wrote another book called Politics. And ethics was kind of interpersonal interaction. It was on that level where politics was uh, kind of the intergroup level um, or how do, you, how do you structure a group properly um, in order to have flourishing for your group of people. And so this sort of uh, question of how we actually all live together in a way that benefits you know, our own group, but hopefully it benefits other groups too, because if we, if we benefit ourselves at the expense of others, guess what, others get upset about that. And eventually you know, it could result in something that's not, not peaceful happening. Um, and so we really need to figure out a way to have these win-win situations where it's not just a win-lose where I win and you lose. It's a situation where we all win together and one of the good things about space is because you are expanding, you'd be expanding our access, you know, humanity's access to resources. Um, one of the things people fight over is access to resources here on Earth because we have scarcity. So if we have access to more resources, that reduces scarcity. And hopefully it should result in more peacefulness because there are more opportunities for people to win in every interaction that we have with each other. Um, yet at the same time, we know perfectly well that there are some people who want to cause trouble no matter what. Um, you know, it's Russia was doing okay until they invaded Ukraine, and now they're actually, they've made themselves worse. They've put themselves in a worse situation specifically so that they could make another person's situation even worse. Everyone seems to be losing in this situation, and yet Russia seems to think this is the right thing to be doing. And so we are stuck once again with the problem of human psychology and individuals and how we interact with each other and how choices are made. Um, 
and the fact that some political systems are better than others. Um, also, because if you have uh, you know, a country that has just one autocratic leader that gets to make all the choices for everyone else, then if they're a bad person, guess what? You get a bunch of bad choices. Whereas in other countries, theoretically, a democracy should do better than that because we have more people who are making a choice and we should at least get a less volatile outcome. This is an argument that Aristotle made 23 centuries ago, is if you have a larger group of decision makers, you should have less volatility in the terms of outcome. Whereas if you have just one person, then if they're really good or really bad, you're going to get very extreme examples of this. And when it comes to space, once again, we have to figure out how are we all going to cooperate together because we have many nations here on Earth and uh, they all have different political systems and they might have different goals for how they're looking at space and what they want to get out of space and their exploration or, or use or settlement of it. I'm happy you brought that up because I wanted to ask you. Um, so as a person, I think that decentralization is always a good thing. Like you just said, Aristotle said that there should be more people making decisions than just one central entity. And I do believe that. I do believe that more decentralization is always better because um, I think you also mentioned in the book the concept, which I never knew that there was a word for it, uh, subsidiary, mm -hmm. subsidiarity. I'm yes. sorry. If, you got if it. I'm, uh, it's a new word for me, so. And it's, it's very interesting because that's exactly why I, what I think that is the most efficient in solving problems. Decentralize, make the parts as fragmented as possible so that you can reach the problem on its smallest scale because this is how we can solve problems. Only when it's, they're very, very well defined and um, we know what to do as a next step as opposed to having a very big problem where throwing money at it, for example, wouldn't solve it. We have to go back to the basics. In our societies, in North America or in the West, ethical decisions or decisions in general are being done by supposedly democratic governments. But eventually, it's, is it really democratic like do do people have a say in whatever the decision makers are are doing or saying um do people actually um for example the war do people are do do they have a voice in actually um approving their government's uh funding a war or for example in in in, in space exploration do people have a say in what Elon Musk is doing? I feel like it's still, with all of this progress, it's still central and we're still risking the, um, the idea that it's only within a certain group of people that these decisions are being made and we are not sure that they are taking the everyone's best interest in, at heart. And the only reason um, I'm asking this is because, for example, there is a hypothesis, a very strong hypothesis, for example, that COVID escaped from a Wuhan lab. Regardless of what all, all the other hypotheses are saying, this is the hypothesis that looks like it's the has the most evidence so far. So even if there's evidence in another direction. But with regards to this, the decision to have a gain of function research lab was done by a small group of people and did not think about the ethical problems of it or what the catastrophic consequences that it would happen um, and it would create. I'm sorry. So what do you think? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that's the sort of research that should never be done. There, there have been plenty of examples of people doing this sort of research all the way back to the 1970s. And for all we know, maybe earlier than that. Um, typically, in the 1970s, they were thinking in terms of biological weapons. Um, and that's the thing about any sort of gain-of-function research, is that you can say, oh, we just want to understand how the virus might mutate. But at the same time, <laughs> you're basically creating something that can be used as a biological weapon. And that should not be the kind of research that people are doing. Uh, yes, oh, it's interesting to know more about how the virus operates. Is that interesting information you're going to get from it worth it? I don't think so. And I think that uh, we've seen, you know, potentially the risk of, of what could happen if those sorts of situations go out of control. And by the way, biological labs 
make mistakes all the time. This is something that you don't hear about generally because they either, if they file the incident report, maybe it wasn't that uh, you know big an incident. But sometimes these are actually really big incidents and they do happen. Uh, and it's not just ha things that happen in other people's countries. It's things that happen in, in you know, well-developed, perfectly well-run functioning countries too. Um, accidents happen, there's no way to prevent them. And so this really gets into the question of risk standards, which um, you know is something that I talk about in the book in terms of how do we make these collective, you know, societal decisions about risk? Because it's not really everybody making the decision together. It's really often just one person or a small group of people, whether it is, you know, a billionaire who's decided he's gonna make his own rocket company, or whether it's a small group of people who deciding that they're gonna fund gain of function research and those sorts of things. And we have to ask ourselves, well, who gave them the authority to make this? choice and the answer is that uh, either there's no rule about it because it's a new technology um, maybe there's no federal guidance and then once again you get into the subsidiarity question that you were saying before um, the subs basic idea of subsidiarity is that you should always solve a problem at the lowest level that you can solve it at now if you're talking about something like gain of function research you can't necessarily solve that at the lowest level because people will make mistakes if you have a laboratory that says, hey, we're working on gain of function research on this horrible virus and it's gonna affect the entire world, guess what? The entire world should have a say in that. It shouldn't just be a few people who are making that decision. Um, and yet at the same time, that is the way that we've uh, currently structured the way scientific research operates. Scientific research has a kind of risk perspective, which is that anybody can research anything they want to. And uh, because ultimately that research should benefit everyone. Um, that's the theoretical understanding behind it. Um, notice there's no, there's not necessarily a connection between doing research and actually benefit every, every, benefiting everyone. That's not necessarily something that happens. And we have plenty of examples of, of horrible scientific research that has happened in the past in terms of what the Nazis did in World War II or what the Empire of Japan did in World War II. Um, there are lots of examples of how scientific uh, studies can go horribly wrong also in terms of technological development. Technological development can also go badly wrong. And that kind of borderline between science and technology is also a really interesting one because it's one thing to study a natural virus and it's another thing to tweak the virus, which would be through engineering and through technology to turn it into something that it wasn't before. And so that's actually an abuse of technology, I would say. It's using technology in order to get more science, but it's not necessarily beneficial. And um, you know, once again, getting to the, the bigger picture questions of uh, what's an acceptable use of technology, um, what's an acceptable way for us to be interacting with each other on, on the face of the earth, how do we, how do we all get along, so to speak, um, then we need to ask ourselves, what is the right level to solve these kind of risky questions at? Should we just be having one person make these choices or just a small group of people making these choices? Or is this something that we all need to say in? Because I think if you uh, if you asked everybody, hey, is this a risk that you're willing to take? Um, you know, maybe we'll have a pandemic that kills, you know, millions of people. You'd probably say, no, I don't think that's actually, I don't think you're getting one or two scientific papers out of this is worth risking everyone on the earth. And these sorts of questions um, are things that currently our government isn't actually that good at solving. Um, they don't want to pass regulations about this kind of stuff. They want to, they want to leave it at, the, at a level that's low enough to solve the problem, but which is actually not at the right level to solve the problem at. Um, they'd like to think that, that the scientists are going to make the right choices, but the scientists actually have not been uh, strongly versed in ethics. They don't know a lot of you know, risk management theory or things like that. Um, so it would probably be, at this point in time, it's probably a good uh, idea to say, Maybe we need a little bit more control over the scientific and technological process, and we need to think harder about what is an acceptable level of risk that just one or a few people are exposing the rest of us to, and whether we want to agree to that or not. Now, that's a dangerous choice, because what that will do is it will slow down, it could potentially slow down a lot of scientific and technological advancement. And if you talk to anybody who is an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, they'll say, we don't want government regulation, government just messes everything up. And to a certain extent, that's true. I mean, there's, there are reasons why the technology industry, for example, popped up in Silicon Valley as opposed to other places in the country. It's because uh, California law does not permit the enforcement of non-compete agreements. And a non-compete agreement is a 
is something that a company will force its employees to sign and say that you're not going to leave our company and work for a competitor. And California said, nope, we're not going to allow that here. So that allowed the free flow of talent between companies, and it actually greatly increases the efficiency of technological research. Now, that's going, of course, off into a tangent. But to bring it back, we say to ourselves, what is the right balance? How fast do we want to be going forward? Is there a proper speed? Is there a good speed of technological advance? Is you know, gas pedal all the way down the right approach? Or do we need to also use the brake pedal every once in a while? And uh, I think the answer is yes, we do need to use the brake pedal every once in a while because you know people don't make cars without brake pedals. That's just not a good idea. Um, so we need to think to ourselves, what is the goal? What's our objective that we are literally, if you want to use a metaphor, metaphorically driving towards? Um, and then think about what are the right tools and the right ways to apply those to the problems as we are going towards that goal. Interesting. Um, the issue is that I still, I, I, for example, when it comes to technology and you're, you're closer and your experience is with the technology itself, um, something, for example, like Google. So yes, I, in, in, in an ideal world, everyone will have to be participating in the society to answer these questions. But for example, if, if, um, if Google is now, it feels like they're more, the, the big tech are, might be more, I don't want to say more powerful than governments, but they kind of are because they are, go, they are the source of information. If I want to see anything, I would have to go to Google and search for it. And if Google decided that they want me to show, to see specific information that would make my decision biased or make me agree to what the government wants me to do, then do I really have a choice in it? It's still made, it, the decision is still made by few people, even though eventually I said, yeah, yeah, okay, I agree with that, let's do it. But, and to go back to one of the concepts of your book is like informed consent mm -hmm. and how, how much I'm informed or as a society we're informed in order to be one, participate and to actually participate and even have a, a voice in that. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing I would say is that the, the big tech companies have that power because the, gov the government has not decided to take it away from them, right? They've, they've uh, basically said it's a, it's a free-for-all because they didn't want to stifle innovation. And they said, if you want to edit search results, you can do that. And that's, that's very much done. Search results are edited. Um, and a prime example of this is what is suggested to you when you type in a search. So um, this research was done just a few years ago. Somebody tried typing in various groups of people like uh, this group of people is, and then it'll give you a fill in the blank search results and it has a whole bunch of horrible insulting things on it, right? And, and Google saw that and it's, ah, we don't want that. So they edit the results. They don't want those coming through. So this absolutely does happen. Um, and. I think, you know, to a certain extent, the, the people who are who are part of that group are probably happy that they are not having these horrible, you know, stereotypes about them spread through Google. Um, and at the same time, you can also see that, that that same kind of lever of power, if you want to think about it as a lever that you can, you know, switch one way or the other, uh, gives Google an incredible amount of power to do a lot of other things, too. Um, and some of those things... Uh, you know, people are not going to be comfortable with if it's, for example, suppressing certain sorts of information or promoting certain sorts of political ideas and those sorts of things. And so we need to ask ourselves, is this a power that is being, uh, is this power being given to the right level for the decision making process? And some people say yes, and some people say no. And uh, depending on that, you know, if if there are enough people who say, no, this is not the right level, then you have to shift it up to the level of the federal government, which is going to say, uh, Google, you need to make sure you're doing this. You need to be fair or follow regulations as far as this goes. Um, and the, yeah, none of these issues are simple. <laughs> I'll just put it like that. Um, that uh, it's a constant balance and a constant struggle. One of the things that we have in in you know western society is we have pretty vibrant economies you know uh, we we have entrepreneurs who are doing interesting things we have research constantly being done we have this technology always being developed and it's good because largely it does benefit people but there are these sorts of 
places where they run into an exception and they say, are we actually helping people anymore? And I think, you know, social media content moderation has been a huge issue in terms of what should be allowed or, or not allowed on social media. Or is social media even good? Maybe it's just making everybody angry at everyone else. Uh, it's kind of fundamentally uh, dangerous in that way if it's just making everyone upset. Because once again, that, that breaks down social trust. It, it uh, impedes our ability to actually cooperate with each other. Um, and so we need to ask ourselves, uh, it seems like we're not equipped to solve the problem. How do we become equipped to solve the problem? And the answer is, well, we become better decision makers and we figure out what resources we need in order to solve these sorts of decisions. And that's, once again, gets back to kind of these fundamental ideas of ethics. What ethical tools can we look at in order to solve these problems? Uh, so for example, if you look at the way, you know, a startup operates, a startup is just a small group of people deciding to do something new. That is a risk standard, which says that we're gonna allow people to come up with new ideas and do new things, even if they're dangerous. Um, if, we, if we say that's an unacceptable risk standard and make it more difficult to start a new company, then that will prevent a lot of ideas from coming through but, and it's gonna slow down technological process and perhaps put us at a competitive disadvantage with other countries that are allowing that. You know, that's kind of the, one of those competitions between countries things that we need to think about also. Um, so we need to, you know, decide once again, do we want to go faster? Do we want to go slower? What kind of uh, laws or rules do we want to exercise? And then what are the ethics that are behind those ideas? And uh, what is what is fundamentally the, the good that we are aiming for and the bad that we want to avoid? So you bring a good point about um, social media. I actually wanted to ask you about this because I'm trying to um, to connect the dots in order to arrive at my final question. So decades ago, um, everyone was very excited about social media and <clears throat> everyone thought that they were going to connect with loved ones from across the globe. We we're going to be able to connect with strangers, um, even look up not just social media in general, mm -hmm. like the, the, the technology will be able to look up information of anything and facts um, and, um, and we will be able to talk and debate and see the all sides of a conversation and and we're we're going to be more powerful as individuals because we will be able to have the information right in front of us and then we choose to decide choose how what's how what to prioritize what information is important and we'll know what's the fact from the fiction because we can fact check it now no one i think at the time maybe very few people probably people like yourself would have seen the slippery slope and the negative consequences of what happened. So when it comes to this technology, um, we didn't think that people will, and this algorithm, and when you're saying like the, the hand is on the lever and making sure that you're tweaking the, 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 the algorithms as you want, no one would, th would have thought that people would be engulfed in their own echo chambers. No one would have thought that polarization will be, even though we can look at the information both at the same time, we will come out with completely different conclusions because the algorithm is showing me one different fact than what it's showing you, for example. No one thought that teenagers would look at the social media and, and have an unrealistic expectation of, of reality. No one saw that. But right now we're moving from the problem of a Google search to the AI and chat GPT. So I wanted to ask you about this because I know that you are, um, you're, you're familiar with this and uh, you are um, uh, very knowledgeable in the AI and the technology and the ethics around it. So please tell us about this. Yeah. The so this is another absolutely really important question. Um, artificial intelligence is, first of all, it's, it's moving really, really fast right now. And we can ask ourselves, are we using it for the, all the best things that it can be used for? And are we also controlling how it's being used? So for example, in the education sector, you know, every, every teacher, every professor, every university and high school and grade school 
needs to be thinking right now, are the students cheating on writing their essays or answering other sorts of questions by using chat GPT to answer stuff for them? And the answer is, they should be. I mean, really, everybody needs to be thinking about these things. And then how are we going to solve this problem? Um, you know, some one of my colleagues described it as, you know, chat GPT came out on, I think, uh, November 30th or something like that of last year, just in time for finals week, just in time for college <laughs> essays to go in from students applying to college. And it's like they, they picked the most horrible time to possibly do this, right? And like maybe a better time. They could have released it in the middle of summer when, you know, school wasn't even happening. There could have been better ways to do this. Um, and yet they did it. Once again, it's a small group of people who are deciding that they're going to change the world together. And then what's the benefit that we get from this? And the benefit is, you know, millions of people have been entertained by asking, you know, ChatGPT to write them a song or, or something like that. Um, and you say, okay, well, that's interesting. That's, that's unique. That's remarkable. Sounds it seems good. To have... Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, then you at the same time blow up the whole educational system of everyone on the entire planet. <laughs> um, because you know, anybody anywhere can access this. Um, and if, well, if you have internet access, that is, and of course you have to sign up for an account and all those other sorts of things. And we can ask ourselves, did OpenAI make the right decision here? And the answer is probably no, I would say. This is a big negative consequence that we have experienced because of a small group of people making a choice. Now, if they had limited the release on it and said, you can have access to this if you have, uh, you know, certain sort of credentials or something like that, then, you know, there'd be a certain number of people saying, oh, this is so much fun. I'm enjoying it or, you know, doing whatever I'm doing. Uh, talking, you know, chatting with this AI. It's very interesting and amusing. Um, and that would perhaps hopefully reduce the amount of negative impact. If a bunch of students don't have access to it, then they can't use it to write their papers for them. Um, but that's not what happened. And at this point now, we need to figure out how to back up and solve this problem. Because once one person does it, it makes it much easier for anyone else to want to do it. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could even see this as a form of sabotage, like one country could release this model and advertise it to all the students in another country saying, hey, don't write papers anymore. Use our software to write papers for you. And in that way, you would sabotage another country's educational system, even if that country, um, you know, tried to control it in their own country. Another country could try to, to, you know, sabotage them in that way. And it's kind of a slow form of sabotage by trying to spread cheating through a populace of students because, um, you know, there's, the immediate effect is that the students don't learn the material. And uh, the follow on effect is that they don't learn material and that starts negatively affecting society when they get out to it. And it also includes the expectation of these people are habituated towards cheating, which from a virtue ethics perspective um, says you're creating bad people, right? They're, they've made bad choices in the past. Now they've made that a habit of making bad choices. And that's a really bad situation to be in. And we need to make sure that does not happen. Um, the worst thing you can do as a culture, as a civilization, as a society, is to uh, is to incentivize bad behavior. You want you want to have a society where good behavior is rewarded and bad behavior is punished. If you do the reward the reverse, sorry, and you reward bad behavior and punish good behavior, then guess what? Your society is going to turn really bad, you know, pretty quickly. And we need to consider right now whether we are doing that to ourselves. And, and once again, it's AI has become the, the tool that is enabling this to happen. Um, do we need to regulate AI? We probably do need to regulate it. Um, one thing I would say is that, uh, once again, this gets into the subsidiarity question. One of the things about subsidiarity is that it assumes that people at the lower levels can actually solve their problems. We're going to say, you know, the federal government says we don't have a rule about AI. We hope that technology companies will make the right decision on their own. Because why? Because we assume that they have good people working for them, they have good motives for society, and they actually want to help people. If they demonstrate that they are not capable of doing that at that level, that's when it has to go up to the next level and we have to say, what is the right way to solve this problem? We wanted you to be able to do it at the lower levels. You obviously made the wrong choice. Now we need to step in from the outside and correct this mistake that you made. Yeah, lots to think about, I guess. 
because it's um, that that is assuming that everyone behind the AI or the AI itself is neutral or is not biased because they're, they're, I think there yeah. has been testing <laughs> there has been testing by people on on asking it questions and then it responds with a one-sided it's mm -hmm. like a biased um, view and it's just kind of kind of the next step of where we are the um, I, I like this is a new term that came out recently it's a uh, one screen two movies kind of a thing mm -hmm. uh, people are seeing the exact same thing and they're coming out with different conclusions mm -hmm. um, which is fascinating I guess like it's it's scary as well mm -hmm. um, to, to, to see something and people would attribute motives and intentions and things to one thing but we're both seeing the same thing um, so I guess this is the the question then how, in addition to what you just said about the educational system and what happens to the science and research and and um, how do we know that it's it is uh, not going to take over a the the human's ability to make decisions and when would it have its own when would the AI become then responsible for its actions and not humans? Yeah, and, and what I would say is that the AI is not capable of being responsible for its own actions. It's always the people behind it. Um, ultimately, what artificial intelligence does is humans delegate a certain amount of power to it. And then based on that delegation of power, the AI does that automatically. It's supposed to automatically solve a certain set of problems that humans have delegated to the AI to solve. If the AI does that well, then nobody's going to worry about it. We're going to say, okay, this is this is working perfectly fine. And so we have all sorts of factories with robots in them. We have all sorts of people uh, using machine learning for data analysis and those sorts of things. And as long as it works well and it's benefiting people, uh, it's not a big concern. But when it starts going wrong, then we need to step back and say, okay, the, the, automa the automation that we're using here has failed or it's making some sort of mistake. Is there a way that we can adjust the way it's making that? Or do we need to actually pull back all of that delegation and no, no longer have AI have this power. And um, there's been a lot of interesting philosophy actually that's been done on this. So for example, there's a philosopher named Shannon Valor. She's at the University of Edinburgh. She used to be at Santa Clara University where I worked you know, pretty closely with her on several projects. And she has uh, talked about this idea of what are the skills, you know, because we delegate skills ultimately to, to artificial intelligence. What are the skills that we need to make sure we keep and among those skills are we need to understand what we're actually doing. We need to have understanding. We need to have wisdom for the application of that understanding. We need to maintain our ability to make ethical choices. And we probably need to actually get better at making ethical choices. And ultimately, we need to have an understanding of politics and how politics works as a good end. How do we cooperate together in order to make a good society that people actually want to live in? Those are a set of skills that we cannot delegate and automate because if we lose those skills, then guess what? We don't have the skills anymore. <laughs> we we de-skill ourselves to to use another word that that uh, Shannon Valor has used a lot and that I have adopted from from her uh, terminology. If we lose those skills, if we de-skill ourselves, then we're going to be in big trouble. We're not going to be able to make ethical decisions as well as we used to. We're not going to be able to cooperate with each other politically as well as we used to. And we're not going to be able to understand things. We're not going to be able to use that understanding towards good ends. And of course, if you look at society these days, you might say to yourself, I think this is already happening. <laughs> Where, and it's not necessarily because it's not necessarily because we've delegated it to automation, although it is to a certain extent through social media, because so, we've allowed social media to polarize us and pull us off in these little echo chambers so that we can't talk to each other anymore. And I like the phrase that you, you just used this one screen, two movies. Um, that's because we, we're coming from very different interpretive frameworks now where we're understanding reality in very different ways. And so we really need to ask ourselves, okay, we've delegated a power to AI. Maybe we should not have done that. Uh, what if we just went to the old style of Facebook algorithm? Facebook back in the day, you know, more than, more than 10 years ago, 
uh, Facebook was just, this is what your friend said in chronological order over the last you know time since you looked at it. And Facebook decided to instead use AI for that and it ended up screwing everybody up. <laughs> Maybe it's time to go back to the to the way before this experiment was run, because you can think of this as being a big technological experiment upon society at the scale of millions and millions of people who are being uh, affected by it. You know, more than millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people, ultimately. Um, and when we when we see these problems appear, we need to think about how do we fix them? And the fact that we aren't actually able to fix them because our government is not operating properly shows that we've also lost some sort of political skills. Or, or other sorts of problems have happened. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I do ethics. I'll just say it right now. I think we need to be better at ethics now than we've ever been in the past because we have so much more power and so much more responsibility to get things right. Um, and that's really why I do what I do as, as I think we need to get better at ethics. We need to figure out how to make good decisions. And we really need to scale this all the way up you know, through society from the top to the bottom, you know, from the students who are just entering grade school all the way up to the politicians who are making these big decisions. We need to figure out uh, what is the good that we're aiming for and how do we actually cooperate to make that happen? Okay, so I have a follow-up question about this. And I'm happy, uh, like, because um, you, you brought out up uh, Facebook, and what it did and how it was and what it is now. We kind of have a case study on whether Facebook scaling back all of its alg algorithms back to the basic with the idea that right now Elon Musk purchased Twitter mm. and all of the behind the scenes hands that, was, that were... Um, playing with the algorithms is now has been lifted and Twitter is now kind of going back to the basics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Twitter files that came out and all of the the the, the new information that Elon Musk exposed uh, after he took over. It's kind of disturbing because you can see that, yes, it is an algorithm, but it has people behind it who did certain things so kind of twitter is an example of how facebook uh, the, the 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 consequence of facebook scaling back now from your perspective uh do you see that with twitter made a difference and we can now apply what twitter did on all of the platforms or you don't see the change and how do you view what happened and is it good or bad yeah, I, so I'm not that familiar with Twitter. I don't spend much time on Twitter. I know that, uh, for example, various people have been reinstated who were who are not allowed on Twitter previously. Um, I know that uh, some of the people that I talk to, you say that I, I would say that they don't like the changes that have happened. Other people I talk to say they do like the changes that have happened. Um, but I'm probably not in the best position to, to actually evaluate that because I'm not that familiar actually with how things have changed. Okay, fair enough. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, since we were talking about AI right now and the algorithms and w in the book, uh, you speak a lot about the intelligence and if humanity encountered intelligence, whether we should, from an ethical perspective, uh, we have to think about it, whether it has intrinsic value or it has value because we assigned it value. Mm -hmm. How does this, uh, the AI that we are now going to be experiencing, uh, or we are now experiencing, how do we have to think about it? Like, can you, can we yell at Google Home when it says something wrong? Is it, does it have value? And, and I'm going to let you answer this because I have a follow-up question afterwards. All right. Yeah, so one of the things I would say is that it's very easy for people to anthropomorphize things. And, and so for people, people, for example, name their cars and they, they talk to their computer. Um, you know, everybody does this. This is a pretty basic, normal thing to do. And especially if we see, if it seems like something is, is intelligent, so perhaps, you know, an artificial intelligence, uh, we might be tempted to interact with it away, in a way where we are attributing more intelligence to it than we should. Uh, really what's going on there is it's our own intelligence and we're projecting it onto other things. Why is that? Because humans throughout history 
have interacted with each other that way. We interact with people, we interact with our pets, you know, dogs learn words that we say, um, you know, and obviously uh, we're very used to this idea of being able to talk to things, but I don't think we should get used to the idea of AI actually being intelligent. And this is one of the weird things about um, text generating artificial intelligence. So for example, we have the case from the summer where there was a Google engineer who was playing with a Google text generating algorithm. And uh, he basically got very concerned about it. And he said, this, this uh, algorithm is acting like it's sentient, like it really understands that there's something there behind it. And, and he basically you know, told everyone about it. And other people said, no, look, it's just, it's copied what people say on the internet. When people say things on the internet, they say, I feel this way about this. And guess what? If, if that's part of the training data set for the AI, then the AI is gonna start saying things like, I feel this way about this. And so I think we should recognize that what we've been doing with our AI is training it to act like a human, but it's not. We're training it to create speech like uh, that imitates human speech. Um, and then that way you could maybe think of it as being like a parrot that doesn't understand the word that it's saying. Um, now, there have been examples in the past of parrots who actually do seem to know what they're saying. There is Alex the Gray Parrot, and Alex the Gray Parrot can do all sorts of things like math and, and have conversations with people. I should look this up. <laughs> <laughs> Alex the Gray Parrot was a very interesting parrot. Um, so, but if you want to think about a parrot that's not as advanced as that particular one, then, uh, you know, it just says things back to you in the order that you told it. And ultimately, that's what artificial intelligence is. It's a big statistical model of how words appear in sentences, you know, next to other sentences and compared to paragraphs and whatever words we input. It then puts that through a big statistical model and spits out a sentence that is uh, what a human would do if they were responding to that based on the statistical probability of what it has seen in the text that is its training data set. So backing up from that, you say to yourself, okay, so when I'm talking to Siri or Alexa or things like that, how nicely should I treat it? And the answer I would say is that there's nobody there. Siri and Alexa are just, are just mathematical statistical blobs living in servers in, you know, somewhere. Um, so there's not a person behind it. However, I'm going to say you should still treat it well, because if you get used to yelling at it and t calling it names and things like that, that could affect your own personality. And this is a virtue ethics perspective again. Uh, it could affect your own personality into turning you into a worse person where you, the next time you see a person, you yell at them and call them bad words because you were doing that with, you know, Alexa or Siri in the privacy of your own home. So I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a different form of argument, right? It's not that you're acting nicely towards Siri or Alexa because they are, uh, you know, there's a person there that you should be, you know, acting nicely towards. It's instead you act nicely towards them because that facilitates a better person in yourself. It helps you become more of the person that you should be. Okay, so to follow up on this, um, in, in my life generally, when I'm trying to look up information, it's really hard work to try and find both arguments to a specific topic. It's, it's actually takes a lot of time to under, read uh, whatever, how many sides, see the, the, the issue, and then try and, and, and simplify it and make, make up my own mind based on critical thinking and what happened. Maybe this kind of helped me because my background uh, in studies is architecture. And in architecture, yes, we design buildings, but most of the things that I do is actually looking at a problem and learning enough about all the other consultants, know enough about what they do in order to bring everyone on the table and simplify the problem in order to resolve it. I, I enjoy that very, very much. But this is something that I would personally do, even though it's not easy, it's hard sometimes, and maybe I will still fall into the biases of things. But what happens with the people who, through no fault of their, uh, of their own, they, they do believe that the AI is someone speaking to them? I have heard of a situation where um, a guy fell in love 
with an AI and has a girl, now it call it a girlfriend. And it's, it is, I don't know what to think about it because how can we even raise children when we know that this is something that could be a possibility? And it's the same kind of people who might fall in the echo chamber of the typical social media who would want, see only one side. It might be those same people who would think that this is the AI, I'm going to believe it, and it's going to be a conscience that I'm speaking to, and I'm going to be hurt and might hurt it again. So yeah, that's what, yeah, what this, concerns me. This is a, actually a, a serious problem that's going to become more serious going forward um, because, yes, there are apps that are specifically designed to pretend that they are, you know, a, a friend or a relationship or some sort of romantic interest of you where it's just a chatbot chatting back to you. And people like that. They, they seek that out. It makes them feel better. Um, one of the problems that, that is existing there, one of the things that's causing this, is that there's an overall kind of epidemic of loneliness in our society where people don't have as many friends as they used to, uh, you know, partly because what do we do? We spend too much time looking at our screens. And so we ask ourselves, you know, maybe, maybe this is not a helpful behavior. Maybe we need to actually spend more time talking, less time looking at screens, uh, you know, think about a traditional human society. What do they do? They talk to each other all the time. They just have a constant conversation like, you know, what have you you know, been doing today? Or it's like going out and gathering, you know, certain sorts of foods or hunting for it or preparing it. Lots of time to just, you know, sit and talk and tell stories and those sorts of things. And now what we've done is we've taken our phones and we put all the stories and all the other things uh, that people normally would have talked about in the past. We put them in the phone so that it now becomes this very different form of interaction where instead of spending all your time talking to people uh, in the real world, now we're talking, we're not even talking to people. We're mostly listening or seeing or inputting information in that way, which is good. It can be very ed educational, right? There's a reason that, you know, a podcast like this or videos like this can be very helpful for people to learn new subjects, but it needs to not be the only way that humans interact with each other. Uh, one of the reasons that schools are very effective, for example, is that in a school, in a classroom environment, it's very social. It's a very social environment. There's the teacher, yes, but there's also all the interactions between the students and other people. I mean, you say hi to, you know, the person who's cleaning up the campus, picking up the trash and things like that. And you can say hi to the principal and you understand how all these different social relationships work. It exercises different parts of your brain. Um, and you have you have friends based on the fact that you interact with people in certain ways. Um, and if we, we start reducing that and cutting it back, then something that's very, very core to human nature starts getting damaged. And so we start looking to, for example, our phone or a chat bot for a companionship. And that's never going to be a good relationship because it's always going to be, uh, if it's a company that's made this, it's going to be monetizing your attention. It's going to either show you advertisements. I mean, you can just imagine your AI girlfriend saying, what you really need is to go to this store and buy this right now because that'll make you happy. And guess what? You figured out a new way to manipulate people into doing what you want. Or, I mean, think of it even worse. Worse things like this in terms of you really need to vote for this political candidate because, you know. <laughs> which kind <laughs> of think, happened. <laughs> which, which in some you know, form. Is, <laughs> exactly. We, we're already seeing. We're, I mean. Yeah. We shouldn't talk about this being only in the future, right? These these things have already happened, and people have put a lot of money into figuring out how to manipulate people using data science and AI and anything else that they can use in order to manipulate people. Why? Because it gives them power and gives them money and gives them the ability to have influence and all those other sorts of things that people are pursuing in life. And so the rest of us, you know, they're, they're looking at us to give them that power, and we should not be willing participants, participants in uh, their ability to do this. We need to step back and say, no, I'm not going to be a part of your system, not going to be a part of your experiment or your desire to make yourself more powerful at the expense of everyone else. Um, and once again, this comes down to uh, individuals and groups need to, to talk to each other and say, how do, we, how do we avoid becoming victims of these people who are ultimately trying to victimize us by using technology in this way? Pair that with the idea of Meta by Facebook. 
and pair that with the idea that people in this generation um, and the coming generations are going to be become more introvert and, and as you said there is a crisis of loneliness um, in, in, in the world it's actually um, heartbreaking because um, it's it, it's not from an at least from an evolutionary perspective that's not what people we are not um, evolved to do be at home alone we mm -hmm. are social creatures and if we're going to fast forward i know that there are lots of people who say there's lots of um, uh, people on earth um, but actually the numbers are showing that there might be a population collapse so all of this and people are not being social and then this technology is making people um, interact less and then uh, probably not making families and fast forward this um, population collapse actually becomes even maybe sooner or, or faster than it is then how are we going to go to space <laughs> so you're you're exactly right actually i mean lots of people have been concerned about overpopulation for a long time and and certainly there are there are things to worry about there in terms of food that is not the problem that we're facing anymore. I mean, it's just plain not. Uh, every country that has gone through demographic transition has not leveled out. They've gone, they've gone into demographic decline. And so this is, this is a problem that is only gonna be made worse by spending time looking at screens or spending time, uh, you know, not with other human beings forming these, you know, ultimately, hopefully, you know, loving relationships with each other where people need to, you know, eventually get married, form a family and have children. If we don't have, if we don't have, you know, future generations, then you're right. There's the population of the earth is just going to decline and, and there's no space exploration. So <laughs> tying it all the way back to, you know, the, the, the big scale subject of space exploration, we need to have people around in order to do that. And what I think is going to happen is that there are going to be certain groups of people who decide they're that they want to maintain, you know, they want to have children, they want to get married. Um, right now, there's, uh, you know, pretty clear evidence that some some groups of people, often they're religious groups of people, uh, you know, the Amish are a prime example in the United States, there are the Amish Mennonites, and they tend to have larger families than everyone else. Um, you can also look at Mormons or people who are Catholic or, or different groups of people, uh, they tend to have more children than others. Uh, that will lead to a sort of uh, change in the demographics of society where the groups of people who have more children are going to, uh, eventually they're going to occupy a larger percentage of the society. Um, is that going to be enough to prevent demographic decline? Nobody knows the answer to that yet. That is a mystery. Um, and ultimately it would be, what am I trying to say? Um, it's, it's not so much that we want to have this competition between groups in the first place, right? We shouldn't be thinking to ourselves, oh, you know, X group is going to take over society because they're having too many children. That has been a prime example of all sorts of bad, bad things in the past where people have said that about each other. And because what is, what is the response is that one group starts attacking another group in order to try to, to stop them. Um, so that is not the way we should be thinking about this problem. Instead, we need to be thinking about how do we all cooperate together in order to produce once again this better future that we can aim for and all benefit from and that requires thinking once again not in terms of just uh my little group or my little you know family or or things like that we need to be thinking about what can we do that is actually going to set up the conditions for everyone to get what they need we want to alleviate loneliness we need to help people uh you know form these sorts of loving relationships how can we create a society where everyone can benefit in this way and ultimately achieve happiness because uh, that's what we're aiming for here people people are happier if they have a happy family life and people who you know never get married end up at the you know never get married never have children never have a strong family life uh, they end up at the end of their lives alone and maybe in a nursing home or something like that and it's just not a happy situation to be in we need to to think about um how do we set up the right conditions in order for everyone to achieve this, uh, you know, kind of happiness that they're capable of. Yeah, and, and also maybe instilling in them the same ethical values that have sustained human civilization. I don't know how we do that. Like, I, 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 I'm not sure right now, like, I always say that there is a, 
there is no there is little difference between for example um the the um, environment that m my parents grew up in and the environment of their parents like it's it's kind of not it is very different but it's also closer like you can see the transition but there would be a huge difference between our generation my generation and like two generations from now and those two generations from now is where my children will be mm -hmm. how do i even translate the ethics that i know across time when i don't know how that time is going to unfold and what would happen yeah so this is this gets right back to the first principle of practical reason again the reason the first principle of practical reason works no matter what is because uh you know do good avoid evil those two things good and evil don't have any content to them there it's a purely formal statement you want to do good and avoid evil what do good and evil mean um there are some fundamental things that you can feed into that um, you know, and this goes all the way back to medieval philosophy. So, for example, there is a, a medieval philosopher named Thomas Aquinas who said there are five things that humans need to do. We need to survive, reproduce, educate children, live in society and seek the truth. Just five things. And if those are the five good things that we can do, you can imagine that the opposite of all of those are bad. Seek falsehood, uh, you know, be lonely and by yourself. Uh, don't educate children. Just let them, you know, turn into little monsters. Uh, don't reproduce and don't survive fundamentally, you know, <laughs> those are all the bad things that we want to avoid. Um, so there are there are some basic good things that we need to do if we want to have a future human civilization that requires, uh, you know, in general, uh, the sorts of behaviors that we need in order for that to happen. One of the other interesting things that Aquinas said about that is he said, not every single person needs to do every single one of those things. Um, so, for example, when there is a war, a certain number of people are going to die. They're not going to they're not going to get to any of those other things because they don't survive in the first place. Not everybody needs to have children. Not everybody needs to be involved in the educational system. Uh, some people can go off and live in the woods by themselves and be, you know, by themselves if they like that. And not everybody needs to spend all their time seeking for the truth. But there are some kind of minimal things that we need to do all together as a society. If we want to, if we want to have a society that's actually sustainable and goes into the future, and uh, you know this gets into the concept of environmental ethics also, which is that people have been talking about sustainability for a long time in terms of protecting the environment, and uh, you know whether it's protecting an ecosystem or even protecting you know the basic things that uh, humans need in order to exist. You know we need to have forests so that we can cut them down and have lumber. Um, and it's, you know, animals can live there while we're, while the forests are growing before they're chopped down again. So there's that kind of instrumental use and there's kind of that uh, intrinsic good that they're aiming for. But we need to get past actually just the sustainability level and back to the regeneration, uh, restoration of, uh, of what the environment was like because we know the environment's getting damaged, it's getting worse all the time. We need to get past sustainability and actually think about restoration. And we need to do that ethically speaking too. We need to get to this uh, kind of uh, more than just sustainable ethics. We need to get to a regenerative form of ethics where, like I was saying before, we need to become uh, ultimately better, better people than we've ever been before. Do you think that people, so with all of this technology that we're talking about, it, it makes me feel, and I don't know if it's true, but people have short memory now a really short memory like I, I i don't know if you're familiar with the um, george orwell's uh, 1984 mm -hmm. it's become a cliche now that it, but it's actually it has lots of things that we are now experiencing it's 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 really it's amazing how how history is being rewritten every single day now mm -hmm. um, the information that you thought you knew now it can be changed because Again, the algorithms decided that, oh, that's old information. No, we want to s you to see this kind of information. And so if people have short memory, and despite the fact that there is abundance of information, do you think that people will learn from the mistakes? And if we're going to do space explorations or few years, like decades into the future, do you think that people will learn? And the reason I'm asking, and I, I, I don't mean to bring that up for any reason other than just to give an example, is that we had the Nuremberg Code for a reason. 
but we still mandated vaccines. It's like we didn't learn from what happens, regardless of however or wherever you, 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 you stand on the vaccine issue, we still mandated them. Just the idea of mandating something that just a few years back, we decided that it's going to be a very unethical and bad thing to do, and we still did it. So how do you see civilization moving forward with the short memory versus lessons yeah. learned? So what I would say is that that it the the importance of memory is obviously incredibly important. You can't learn from the past if you don't know what the past is. And ultimately, this gets to the question of what's an educational system for. The educational system is to take important things that humans have learned in the past and pass them on to future generations. So what we need to do is, once again, think about what is important. What, what have we experienced as a civilization? Uh, and not just, you know, as individuals, yes, and also as families, as groups, and as a civilization, you know, encompass everything because there's lots of information out there. And we need to find the most important and relevant things out of that. And we need to make sure that we pass that on to the next generation. Now, one of the things that's really difficult about that is that not everybody can know everything. The world is way too complicated. So we have division of labor. You know, we have different we have different majors in college because not everybody can take everything and learn everything. So we specialize. Really? It seems some... like now people, <laughs> everyone knows about everything all the time. <laughs> that is the promise and peril of the internet. Yes. <laughs> and, and so we, but ultimately, right. We cannot know everything. And I think actually it might be that, that striving to know everything that makes us forget so much also, right. We might've known something a decade ago that we don't remember now because we've continued to deluge ourselves in so much internet information that it gets erased. Um, and so we maybe, you know, the question is, how do we make sure that we're passing on the highest quality information? Maybe the internet's got too much junk on it, right? Um, and then, of course, you get answer questions like who gets to decide what the junk is? Um, and that's a big perilous question that I don't <laughs> don't want to touch um, because because ultimately it would be great. I mean, the ideal world is where every single person makes the right choice voluntarily on their own all the time. And that's, you know, basically, if you look at a religious idea of heaven, that's what heaven is supposed to be. Everybody just makes the right choice all the time. And therefore you're living in heaven because everything's just good. Um, that is not possible here on earth because humans are limited and we make mistakes and we have all these sorts of other, you know, problems that we have. Um, you know, and name it, there are plenty of problems. So then the question is, how do we try to actually uh, create the best society that we can without tipping over into this horrible totalitarianism of, you know, everybody trying to force their ideas on everyone else? Because, you know, one of the one of the worst things that happened in the 20th century are these utopian ideas of we're going to have this communist state that's going to be perfect and everyone's going to be happy. How are we going to achieve that? Well, we'll just kill everyone who's not happy. And that way everyone will be happy. Guess what? That doesn't actually make everyone happy. It makes everyone very, very concerned that they're going to be the next person killed. And you end up creating hell instead of utopia. Um, those are bad ways to arrange your society. Um, and yet, of course, if you forget that those things have happened, people try to do them again. And uh, once again, this should be the job of the university. This should be the job of educators everywhere to remember these sorts of things and pass this this uh, high quality information on to the next generation. Um, but uh, once again, we're constantly kind of struggling and fighting with uh, what are the most important things to remember. And even that, what qualifies as important and what is actually false. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation and active disinformation that is being put out there. Once again, you know, there are lots of foreign countries who are perhaps enemies to, to, to you know, the Western world to the ideals of freedom and, and self-determination and all those sorts of things who are constantly trying to dump these bad ideas into our culture in order to derail us. And, uh, you know, I mean, and it's not it's not like there's a conspiracy theory either, right? Everybody knows that there's a that there are entire buildings in other countries that are dedicated to spreading propaganda and misinformation and disinformation in other countries. So, uh, you know, how do we protect ourselves against that? How do we set up an educational system that is actually preparing people to be good human beings in the future? 
these are all genuine questions that we need to continue pursuing. And, and what's the urgency of this? This is the top urgency level, right? This is like, if you get this wrong, your civilization collapses <laughs> and, and bad, bad things happen, like many, many people die. So we need to think about this in terms of it being a very, very high priority. Okay. Um, that's great. Um, I, I do have, before we continue, it is, uh, we have been recording for an hour and a half. I wanted to ask you, uh, how's your time? I can, we can wrap this up or we can go a little bit like, uh, more. So whatever if you, you want, want to go another half hour or so, or that would be fine. I don't, I, the only thing I need to do is I need to eat lunch eventually. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then if, if we can go, I do have a few questions that I would like to ask you. So thank you. Um, so I, I, I came across the book, the, the idea and the definition of happiness, um, and what it means. What do you, how do you define happiness? Because it, it, to me, like maybe from my, from my perspective is that people might be happiest, not because when they're looking for happiness is when they are overcoming suffering and, or hardship. I feel like I'm happiest at least when, when there is a very big problem that I'm able to solve. After mm -hmm. I solve it, I, it's like, I don't think that people, as much as they would like to have a cocktail at the beach all day long and this is happiness, I think that eventually they know that it's not. So how do you define, and the philosophers that you cited in the book, how do they define happiness? So this is a really good question. Some, some philosophers have very different understandings of happiness. So for example, if you look at utilitarians like uh, Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill, their understanding of happiness is merely pleasure. In other words, are you, you know, do you like eating this kind of food? Well, eat that kind of food. Do you like doing this activity? Then do that. And, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill puts the only limitation on it being that you should pursue your happiness as long as it doesn't injure anybody else's ability to pursue their happiness. Now, if you look at that from a kind of a more substan substantive perspective, I would say that's a very, that's, that's not really a good understanding of happiness ultimately, because lots of people think things will make them happy and do not, do not actually make them happy. Like you were saying, you'd think that sitting on the beach, sipping cocktails all day long would make you happy, but pretty soon you're like, man, this is boring. I need something else to do. Um, and so it's not actually what makes them happy. And people have misconceptions about this. And I think, once again, if you turn to, to other philosophers, they would say things like, what makes you happy is that you have uh, kind of the virtues. The virtues would be excellences of human uh, capacities. So we have a capacity, for example, to solve problems. And the excellence of that capacity makes you an excellent problem solver. And then every time you solve a problem, you feel good about it because you used your human capacity in the way that it is meant to be used, which is to actually do something productive. And it doesn't have to be really abstract stuff either. It can be like working on your car. Your car has a problem and you need to fix the car. So you figure out how to fix it and then it's fixed at the end. And you can be satisfied that you did something productive that made you happy. You used your inherent capacities for, for doing things, for pursuing the truth. If you want to think about it that way, because a functioning car is a kind of a truth in a practical sense. Whereas a non-functioning car is kind of broken or false or however you want to think about it in a, in, a, in a practical sense. And so if we want to be happy, we ultimately need to take those, those uh, kind of capacities and potential uh, that we have in ourselves and we need to actualize them. We need to turn them into the best that we can be. And so if, you, if we all have the capacity, for example, to play a musical instrument or to play a sport or to do a certain type of craft or skill or perhaps to do mathematics or to program computers or all these various things that humans can do. When we become excellent at those things, when we, uh, you know, we become very good at doing them and we actually get to exercise those skills, that feels good because like you're saying, we've, we've encountered an obstacle and we overcome it. So if you've ever had to play a piece of difficult music, for example, and you've managed to, to achieve being able to play it well at the end, you say, you can be satisfied. Yes, I played that, that piece of music well. And like I said, same for everything else. 
if we really want to be satisfied in life, we need to encounter challenges and overcome them. And so um, the question is, of course, how do we set up a society where people have all the basic things that they need so that they're not struggling, they're not starving and in poverty and sick and things like that, and then give them an outlet on top of that to develop excellent skills so that they can use their problem solving abilities to do something which is productive for society. And this is actually an interesting question because if you back up in time, everybody had to use all their skill just to survive. And so if we take away all that kind of necessary skill needed just for survival, then we have to kind of come up with what's the next step beyond just surviving. And the question is, like you said, it's happiness. How do we live a flourishing life where we can, you know, live in society together and my flourishing doesn't, you know, prevent you from flourishing. We have these win-win situations once again. And uh, this is actually, you know, if you want to get back to the topic of space, I think this is a great argument for space exploration, right? Which is that space exploration is really, really hard. It's super difficult. Uh, people cannot do it by themselves. They, we have to cooperate. It's not like I can personally build my own rocket. Elon Musk, you know, has driven, yeah, you know, he's gotten his own rockets now. At some point, he'll probably go into space. But the way he did that was by cooperating with many, many people and sharing his vision with them in order to do that. So once again, I think happiness is it's it's a matter of having, you know, you're healthy, uh, you're you have food, you have all the basic things that you need for well-being. And then you have the opportunity to, on top of that, become the best person that you can be. Use all of your natural skills to their fullest potential. Um, so how do you tie this concept with the, another concept that you mentioned in the book? And I, I, I was hoping that you can also clarify it, the entropy. Mm. Um, what is it? And is it related to the idea of happiness in in some form oh that's like overcoming super... that random <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's like a overcoming super randomness question. i guess <laughs> yeah that's a that's a really interesting question i would say which is that you could you know entropy is the tendency to, for things to become more disordered which uh, you know the basic idea is that entropy always increases the amount of disorder in the universe always increases what we can do in certain circumstances is increase order in a limited area. Um, so, you know, that's what we're doing by trying to build a happy society together, right? We're trying to increase order in a particular area. Meanwhile, the rest of the universe is going to become more disordered, but we have the ability in this one little place that we are for now to make things better. And so I guess if you wanted to connect the two of them, it would be that entropy is constantly throwing these problems out to us saying, hey, how are you going to solve the problem of disorder in this you know, new circumstance that you find yourself in. And then we have to solve that problem. And, and once again, it's not something that just one person can solve. We have to solve these problems together as a society, as a civilization. Um, so I, I have to say that I, I really enjoyed the book. I think it is very, very well researched. Uh, I think it's, um, it's dense too. Like there's lots of concepts and things to learn. I, I certainly learned a lot. And <laughs> um, every time I have a question that needs clarification, I would read, I, I wish I would be patient because the next paragraph you would kind of <laughs> <laughs> answer it somehow. Um, but one thing that, that <laughs> it's it's it it was great i i wanted to ask you um how i i know that it it you said in the in the book that it took you seven years to complete it so how come you're able you were able to gather all of the information because if there's one thing that i can say about your book is that even if you're not looking for the ideas of ethics necessarily it's a really good summary of the space exploration the history and now and the technologies in the future it's 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 very it's very dense and packed with information so how did you go from the ethics to the engineering to the space exploration yeah, it's, I mean, <laughs> it, you're right. It took it took seven years altogether from when this project was initiated to when it was done. So 
a lot of it was just learning the material over and over again. I mean, what I will say is that I've loved space exploration ever since I was a little kid. Um, so all, a lot of those ideas have just, you know, been packed into my head over the course of my whole life. Um, and, and when I was an undergraduate, I went to the University of California, Davis, and I got a degree in genetics from there. So I'm familiar with kind of the scientific and technological mindset. So I have that kind of background. When I went to graduate school, my master's degree was in ethics and social theory, and then my PhD was also in ethics and social theory from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. And I guess this book, in a lot of ways, is kind of the, the uh, uh, it's a combination of the skills that I learned in graduate school as far as ethics go, along with my scientific and technological training, and my interest in space exploration ever since I was a kid. I got to put all those together it was difficult. It took a long time <laughs> to put all these things together, but it was a lot of fun. You know, if you want to talk about happiness, you know, the book makes me happy because <laughs> I, I confronted this obstacle and I put all my skills up against it. And I came up with something that I feel proud of, that I feel like I, I did make an accomplishment, which I hope does have a positive impact on the world. Um, now, that said, you know, people need to learn about it. They, they hopefully will find the resources in the book to be useful. Uh, and, but in, of course, in order to find those resources, they need to know about the book in the first place. So I appreciate you inviting me on your show and uh, all these sorts of things. Um, once again, you know, the, the world is a great, big, difficult, complex object that's vastly beyond what any individual can handle. Um, and trying to boil that down into just what, uh, what is the book, like 300 pages or something, it's hard to, yeah. to squeeze in, and of course, also to eliminate all the irrelevancies, to, to squeeze it down into something that, uh, like you said, I tried to make it, I tried to make it packed with information. Hopefully it's still readable, right? <laughs> it, it was, it was. I, I actually wanted to, to tell you, like, yes, it's a lot of information. I learned a lot, but that's why I said it's like it has all the ethical concepts, but also a very good summary on its own for everything that we're dealing with in, 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 in space exploration. Um, I do have two questions. They might take a while, but the first question is, I know uh, you are a, um, um, you are in the World Economic Forum as mm -hmm. the co-chair, um, um, sorry, the um, co-chair in the safety critical Sorry, the responsible use of technology. Yes. Right. Um, so I, I do have to ask you a question because right now the World Economic Forum is in the news and the people who never paid attention to it are now paying attention to it, to everything that they're doing. Um, there are people who are advocates of the research and the work that the World Economic Forum is doing. And there are people who are skeptic and probably critical as well as to how come this organization is able to gather all of these uh, um, uh, political figures and corporations and they get to decide what humanity is going to live based on the research that they're doing. This is just me um, kind of giving like a brief summary of, of the both sides. Can you give us an insider view of what it is and, and what do you think that there, and is, is the, and how is the research contributing to society and what do you respond to, to, to the skeptics and the critics of that um, organization? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. I think um, first of all, I would say that I think people give way too much credit to the World Economic Forum, as if they were actually like some sort of conspiracy taking over the world or something like that. Honestly, nobody's in charge, right? This this is this is the problem with the universe is that you know there's there's no material like human being who's in charge of making the world the way it is. Um, humans like to see order where there is not. So I think that the tendency to look at the World Economic Forum and say things like, oh, they're a conspiracy, they're, they have access to all the world leaders, and they're, they're, you know, they're secretly controlling the world through some sort of conspiracy. I think that's not the right way to look at it. This is an organization that was founded in order to get to improve the world business climate, basically. And the, the way they do that is by talking to governments and saying, hey, reduce your, your business regulations or 
or if they're in favor of business regulation because they are kind of centered in Europe and Europe is actually much more pro-regulation than the United States. Or they say things like, how do we regulate business in such a way that it doesn't harm the business so that we can maintain economic growth you know, worldwide or in whatever countries are willing to make these sorts of changes to, to facilitate economic growth. And so one of the things they've come up with recently is, guess what, if, uh, if technology is gonna be potentially damaging then we need to figure out what the right way is to regulate technology, which is what the papers are that I've been working on. So I've been working pretty directly with them, with the World Economic Forum itself and with other large tech companies, for example, Microsoft and IBM and Salesforce, and we have a couple more papers that'll be coming out later this year. And looking at them and saying, what are you actually doing in order to try to make sure that your products that you release into the world are not dangerous and are not going to harm people what are you doing in order to kind of control them or, or prepare the world um, or make sure that the product uh, meshes with the world in a productive way might be the way to think of it. And so they've been doing various things of, of uh, ways of thinking about technology. For example, is the technology going to be unfair? Is it gonna treat some groups of people differently than other groups of people in an unfair way? Is the technology going to be dangerous? Is it going to crash your self-driving car um, is it gonna is it gonna be unsecure? Is it gonna result in banks having you know cyber security problems where people crack their cryptogra cryptography and steal that kind of stuff with uh, from the bank, for example? Which would be guess what really bad for the world financial situation if some country could hack into the banks and steal all their money. Um, so how do you design your product to make sure that those sorts of risks and dangerous things don't happen? And the answer is that you can use ethics for that. To a certain extent, you think about your product as an ethical, uh, as an ethical product that is going to have an ethical impact on society. It's going to either make the world a better place, or it's going to make the world a worse place, or it's going to not change anything. Now, kind of the default when companies think about a product that they're creating is they're like they'll think to themselves, "Well, we'll release the product out there. It's either going to be beneficial or it's going to be neutral. It's not going to harm the world." But the truth is that a lot of products actually do harm the world. Um, and the, the harm isn't necessarily obvious all the time. So for example, a self-driving car is pretty obvious. If the car crashes and kills somebody, then your product has harmed the world. At the same time, maybe it's preventing a lot of crashes that we don't know about. And it's hard to know exactly what the, what the difference is between the two of those unless you're keeping good statistics on it and you say, oh, you know, if you're driving on autopilot on Tesla, you're like X percent less likely to get in an accident or something like that. But like I said, the default is to think that your product is going to be beneficial or neutral when in fact a lot of the time it is actually causing a harm and it might not be an obvious harm either. It might be that you're playing a video game so much that you are not doing something else that you should be doing. You're neglecting an important either, you know, task in, in your life. You're not spending time with your family. You're not spending time doing something on the job. You're not learning something. You could be reading a book or something like that. And so um, what these tools are that we work with with technology companies is they are they're sharing right now what they're doing internally and then as an outsider coming in from the Markowitz Center uh, we kind of evaluate that and say okay this is useful this is useful um, you know we have this best practices list on the Markowitz Center website for technology ethics um, I think if there's 16 I think best practices on the list and so we compared this against what Microsoft is doing and said look it looks like you're you're trying to do 14 out of these 16 best practices. That's a good sign. Does that mean that everything at Microsoft is always gonna go perfectly all the time? No, because people will still make mistakes and all those sorts of things. But the idea is that if Microsoft shares what they are doing, and then if IBM shares what they are doing, and then Salesforce shares what they are doing, and then other companies all share what they are doing, this will, heart, this will start to develop kind of an industry standard, which is that people will say, this is an expectation that we need to think about these products ethically. What's the impact going to be? Are they going to hurt people? And ultimately, uh, if everybody starts noticing that this industry uh, standard is developing, then that will be shared globally. And hopefully that will result in better technology being produced, technology that helps people and less technology that is actually uh, dangerous and or is, or is possibly going to harm people. Yeah, I am hoping that um, 
the the ethical tools that you're talking about will also in, include uh, slippery slopes because mm. I, I the reason I'm asking is that I, I do understand I understand I hope I understand all sides and I do understand the side that is um, critical because when they hear concepts like digital passport, digital identity, vaccine passport, battery passport. Now this is a new thing by the World Economic Forum. They, it's hard for them not to see what the consequences of this would be. For example, in Canada, they applied the vaccine passport. If you don't have it and it turns red on your phone, you're not getting into any of the uh, restaurants in Canada like it's it's kind of yes it might be a good thing but is it like where where how many for example shots do people have to take for this to ta to stay green um, so when when people hear these concepts um, I can understand and sympathize with why they would think it's it's uh, it's uh, not an ideal um, way to organize society. Yeah, and once again, this gets to the centralization versus decentralization problem, which is that uh, who are we going to give the power to, to make these sorts of choices? Um, ideally, like I said, every individual just makes the right choice on their own. Um, and then if you discover that actually a lot of people don't want to, to make that choice, then you have to say, well, is this important enough that we need to force people to do it or not? And and you say, oh, use of force. This is this is something nobody wants to do, right? Um, and yet, we have a police. We have police. We have judges. We have certain sorts of things that are banned. You're not allowed to steal, kill, uh, you know, all sorts of other sorts of things that are that are illegal in society. And then the question is, are the benefits and harms in this particular case that you're talking about? Um, are they worth it? Should we be taking these sorts of measures to try to deal with that question? That's something that you can only decide as a group of people, as a, you know, as a, as a we the people, if, if you're talking about the United States Constitution, for example, we the people create the government and then the government is supposed to reflect the will of the people. And we have elections that are supposed to constantly keep the, the politicians and the government in check to make sure that they're doing what the people want. And that's, you know, one of the wonderful things about having a democracy, which is that we can tell the government what to do and theoretically the government does it. Um, but then once again, we have, if, if we have large groups of people in society who disagree on what the government is doing, perhaps influenced by social media and political polarization and all sorts of other things like that, then, uh, then we get stuck in these really kind of difficult situations where um, you get very strong feelings on both sides and people are not going to be happy. Somebody's going to end up unhappy in this situation. And the question is, is there some way that we can either uh, reduce the harm that they're experiencing from that uh, to make them feel better? Or, um, you know, how, how do we actually negotiate this? And it's just a really, once again, it's a super sticky problem. And it's also at the border between ethics and politics. That borderland between ethics and politics is such a, such a difficult place. Yeah, and I got to say, like, governments are not making it easy when when governments come out and say that we have to reduce carbon emissions, then that yet they use private jets to go everywhere. It's it's yeah, really it's like it's, it can't, you cannot not really insulting. Yes, <laughs> you cannot not look at it. So um, this this happened in California with with the governor was, you know, very much pushing what was it? And he's had, a, he's had a couple of these things happen where he went to a restaurant during COVID um, yeah. and was not taking the proper precautions there. And, and then another thing where he's telling everyone to conserve energy while he was in an office that's had so much air conditioning that he had a sweater on at the same time, <laughs> telling everyone that. to turn their air conditioning up. But his air conditioning was so high that he was cold. So, yes, the the you see things like that. And then, of course, then you become cynical and you say, well, they're not practicing what they preach. Why should why should we do it? And it becomes you know, it's, it, it's it's demoralizing ultimately, right? Where people say, "How can we trust our politicians?" And there's nobody worth trusting. Um, ultimately, is the danger to that. But uh, the in the end, we have to trust each other. We have no choice. Um, and the question is, can we actually get better people? Who are running things who are going to be actually not hypocrites who actually 
are uh, you know respectful of their voters by by not taking these double standards and, and approaches where they're easy on themselves and hard on everyone else you know it, it's i completely agree that it's it's uh, it's insulting ultimately to, to have politicians behaving in that way well that's the dream i hope uh we do get more accountability and 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 less double standards as well. Okay, my final question before I let you go. Um, what is this one thing that you're uh, never asked and you, you wish someone would bring it up? Oh, that's really hard. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I can actually give a good answer to that, but I can give, I can give uh, perhaps one of many things. So, so because I think there are lots of things that people aren't talking about that they should be talking about. Um, what I would say when it comes to space exploration is I think people should be thinking more about the fact that our situation on Earth is actually pretty precarious. Um, we're not nearly as safe as we like to think we are. Um, and the reason we like to think that we're safe is because thinking about being in danger all the time is stressful. Nobody wants to think about that. But we have dangers coming down the line from artificial intelligence. We have dangers from biotechnology. We have dangers from, from nuclear weapons. We have dangers from from bad politicians making bad decisions um and you know there are just so many so many things in the world that are that are bad choices and bad bad possibilities for the future that i think we need to recognize that we're not in a really safe situation right now and we need to be thinking about how to make ourselves more safe and the and of course there's there's two ways to make yourself more safe one is to try to clamp down on everything in a totalitarian fashion um, and, and that's actually not the way to make yourself safe. The way to make yourself safe is actually to, once again, confront these difficulties and overcome them because that makes you a better person and it overall makes everyone better. Um, and, and when you think about it, there's kind of a fundamental uh, difference in this approach to safety that you see in a totalitarian country as opposed to a free and open democracy, which is that uh, democracies are chaotic in a lot of ways and the chaos is actually good the chaos means that we are constantly overcoming these obstacles to make ourselves stronger and better people. We're kind of increasing our uh, resistance to entropy in that way. And, and if you look at a totalitarian country, it's very much the opposite. It's uh, what is the centralized authority going to do in order to make myself, my life easier so that I never face anything difficult. And that actually makes your society very fragile and weak because if the central, if the central government makes a bad choice, it, not only affects everyone negatively, it also means that everyone else is not prepared to deal with it. So we, because they've never been trained, they've never encountered this kind of uh, difficulty that they have to overcome. So, and of course, these are gross oversimplifications because, because all these things are mixed together in society and not everyone is the same, we're all individuals. So of course, there are some people in totalitarian states who are gonna be very uh, resistant to, to, they're gonna be very strong, you know, resistant to the sorts of things they're experiencing. Um, and of course, other people in a, in a democratic society could be very, you know, not used to dealing with difficulty. So this kind of balance between the two of those is important to think about. And I think, I think once again, the, the, the freer side of that uh, actually results in better outcomes in the end. Um, but then the purpose of having this better outcome is so that we can actually overcome these really big and difficult obstacles that we have coming towards us. And we need to consider those obstacles and those dangers, and we need to look at them straight in the eye and say, we're gonna, we're gonna fight you and we're gonna win. Um, we're gonna look at all these dangers that are coming towards us like artificial intelligence or, or everything else, or you know, even if it's a natural disaster, right? If there's an asteroid coming towards the earth, we say, okay, there's an obstacle, we need to figure out how to fight it and we need to figure out how, how to win. Or there's a volcanic eruption. People tend to underestimate the, the sizes of previous horrible volcanic eruptions that have happened because they're pretty bad. Um, volcanic eruptions in the past that have like put the entire world into winter for several years. Those are those really have happened and they're not that unusual. They happen like every couple centuries. Um, you know, and of course the bigger ones are more rare, but uh, even back, I think it was 1815 or something like that, there was a very large eruption that caused the entire world not to have a summer. Uh, and try growing food when you don't have, you know, any food, you know, any light hitting your crops, they, they just wither up and die. So we need to be realistic once again about the, the obstacles that are coming towards us. Um, and we also need to figure out how to cooperate as, as a world because there's no way 
that we can face these things just as, you know, it's not like one country can solve it. Um, it's it's uh, something that has to be solved as everybody cooperating together. And we also need to figure out how to deal with the fact that some countries are going to try to be, uh, some are going to be free riders. They're going to be like, other countries solve the problem, we're going to keep polluting. Um, or other countries are not going to want to cooperate. How do we, how do we, co how do we cooperate enough to actually result in the outcome that we want to have? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the big question that has to be faced is how do we actually solve these global scale problems? And actually, you know, bringing it once again, back to space exploration, I think that space exploration gives us an opportunity to, uh, once again, face difficulties, uh, come up against you know entropy or chaos or whatever it is that's trying to uh, make things more difficult for us it gives us the chance to overcome them and thus become better people and also happier and satisfied with the, the world that we can make for ourselves and uh, ultimately makes us uh, stronger gives us better technology and uh, hopefully better people better human beings who are capable of uh, confronting danger and overcoming it and uh, resulting in a better future. Thank you, that was great. I don't think there is a better note to end the conversation than this. Um, I really do appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and I hope we Thank get you. to do it again sometime. Sarah, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.